Now, it is one thing to eat your own heart out. It's another to dream of the beloved eating one's flaming heart. Now, we might recall at this instance the presence in history of the image of Christ's sacred heart, which appears historically at the same time that William Harvey tells us that the human heart is nothing but a pump. And its, its purpose as a mechanism is to move the blood through the body. There isn't two years separating the uh, appearance of the sacred heart and the appearance of the heart as a pump. And remember, regardless of what faith uh, you uh, ascribe to, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about mythology. The sacred heart of Christ is engulfed in flames. I remember it from holy pictures with the good Ursula nuns from the first grade on, and if you got 100% on the spelling test, you got Christ's sacred heart on a card. And this was serious stuff for a seven-year-old. I believe it's important to pause just for a moment at the new life, La Vida Nuova, at its inception before proceeding to the Commedia, because at this first erotic devouring of his flaming heart by his beloved, Dante not only discovers as his new life progresses through 41 more chapters in the service of love's exploration that his work is inadequate to convey the richness and even the epic grandeur of his theme. It needs, in fact, a larger vessel of verse. You see, he thought he grasped something uh, not complete, but um, whole about the nature of love. And then as it penetrated him in his writing, he realized that 41 sonnets wasn't even a drop in the bucket of what the theme of love implicates. And so he moves on to write a poem of over 14,200 lines to try to grasp, as one of the great poets of Western classical literature, what the iterations of love are comprised of. That container will be over 14,000 lines in a rhyme scheme, and I wish I had time to say more about it, and many of you know this, he writes it in a, well, first of all, he writes the poem in what he calls de vulgare eloquentia, the vulgar eloquent language of the Italians. He doesn't write it in Latin, which is the language of scholarship, because he wanted literate, intelligent, common people to read his poem. And he says in a letter to the man who financed his ability to write it, my poem is not but for implementation. If you aren't willing to take this poem into your life, don't bother reading it. It's not an intellectual exercise. So I want to go to what may be the most um, famous or ranked high on the list of famous couples in Western literature, Paolo de Malatesta and Francesca de Rimini in Canto V of the Divine Comedy, which you know is divided into three canticas. 34 cantos comprise Inferno. 33 cantos comprise Purgatorio, and 33 cantos comprise Paradiso to give us 100 cantos, each of about the same number of lines, and each 
carrying a rhyme scheme. This is where I really want a blackboard uh, of a rhyme scheme. Uh, now it's too much. I, I can't. Uh, of, of a rhyme scheme that is in feet that are comprised of three lines that constitute one foot. The point I want to bring up with that is that the reader journeys through the poem as if he or she were walking. Because the pilgrimage of the poem is to be felt as an embodied experience. How can somebody write a work about love and have it disincarnated? And Dante understood, if I'm going to write a poem about love, I have to implicate the body of the reader no less than 23 times explicitly and at least 20 times implicitly does Dante the poet pilgrim turn to us as reader and ask us how we're doing in the reading. No other poem that I've ever read pays as much attention to us as he does to the content of the poem. All right. So in the second circle of hell is the realm of the lustful, swirling like birds in a windstorm. We recall that, uh, incidentally, can I just ask, how many of you have read any or all of the Divine Comedy? OK, great. Wonderful. Thank you. Be still my heart. I was thinking that maybe two of you would. Great. This is a literate group. <laughs> we recall that almost the entire poem occurs in the domain of the afterlife. Animarum statem post mortem. The state of souls after death. Here in Inferno, souls suffer what was called, what Dante called, contrapasso. Namely, what one did in life is awarded in the afterlife in an infernal, purgatorial, or paradisal manner. Whatever you did in life, that's what you get for eternity. What a definition of hell that is. Now that's scary. The weather in the terrain of the lustful is an eternal violent storm. All who inhabit it are buffeted about. Just to set the scene for you, and many of you will recall it. And Dante writes, now here, now there, now down, now up, it drives them, their lust. No shades are in control of their movement. For like the lust that drove them wandering and out of control in life, they suffer that same condition in the afterlife eternally. This is the world that Dante enters. Virgil, the classical poet and the author of the Aeneid, guides Dante by first offering throughout history individuals who were caught in the violent circuitry of love as lust. Now, I should point out here a necessary feature of all the souls in Dante's Inferno. Every violation, or what is called sin in the Middle Ages, is a form and an expression of love. In the church registry, there are seven sins, and they have been given the epithet deadly for centuries. And you remember them. The biggie, pride. That's where everything else stems from. Covetousness, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, sloth. To counteract these dispositions of the soul. See, I think this is a rich psychology that the church lost sight of. 